All right. Well, hey, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, very excited with, to have our guest, uh, Amy Levine. Um, but before we get started, uh, I want to talk about a couple little housekeeping items. Uh, this is uh, entrepreneurship at DU. Those of you that are, you know, looking for a for a minor or interested in entrepreneurship, we have a, a what's basically a, about a twenty credit minor um, that you are all uh, that it's open to everyone. It's um, and the way it's structured is we have a four credit class and then we have these uh, things called sprints and they're one day, one topic, one credit classes, and um, and then usually offer it on a Saturday and we finish it up with a leadership and execution class. So if there's any interest, my information's um, on the slide, please reach out. And for those of you that are um, in the process of uh, registering, these sprints that I just spoke about, these one credit, one day, one topic classes are open to everyone. And so they are one credit, generally offered on a Saturday, all different topics on entrepreneurship and a really nice way to uh, get exposure to entrepreneurship. So take a look at them and happy to uh, talk to any of you all about them. So let's get on to the what's what's more most important. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Andy Levine, uh, DU alum and founder and CEO of Duvine, um, an international cycling and venture company curating unforgettable travel experiences. And I, I got to tell you, just from my point of view, Andy and I met a while ago, and he and I could have probably talked for about three hours because we share a lot of the same passions around cycling, travel, food, wine. I kind of want to be Andy when I grow up, uh, full, full disclosure, full disclosure on that. So let me let me stop sharing for a second here. Um, give me one second to get this off the screen. Okay, perfect. All right, so we're gonna get started with Andy, but before I, I, do, I like I like that picture. It made me look good. <laughs> before we get started, the one thing that I, I want to the, the format for tonight is we keep this to one hour. We're gonna I have some questions. We're gonna talk for about thirty five minutes. Please put your questions in the chat. At the end of the thirty five minutes, I will uh, will uh, go to Q and A with the audience. So so if you have questions, throw them in the chat. Brandy, um, and uh, uh, and then uh, we'll go from there. So, first of all, welcome. Um, my my first question is: You graduated, and I went off LinkedIn. You graduated in '92. You started your company in '94. Talk us through the day before graduation to starting your company, because it's a very fascinating story. Well, thanks for having me, everyone there out there. Do you? Good to see you. Um, yes, I graduated, I'll, I'll never forget, June 4th, 1992. And June 5th, I was on a plane to France and I was done. The day before graduate, I just knew I wanted to, uh, to go to Europe and I, I wanted to ride my bike. And uh, I landed in France with my bike and just uh, see you later. I mean, I remember at DU, I, I used to ride my bike everywhere to classes and whatnot. And I used to put it on a lot of events. I wish we had an entrepreneur program. Listen, I'm an entrepreneur and I didn't even go to school for it. So all you out there who are in this, like you better be entrepreneurs like today or tomorrow because we didn't have awesome Josh here to, to inspire us and stuff like that. I just had that place, uh, Jerusalem's and would go eat late night there and have the falafel and that inspired me to, to get out of Denver. Um, but, you know, I, I, listen, I just knew that uh, I wanted to, uh, uh, to go discover a foreign land and, 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 and I could have probably landed anywhere, but I landed in Burgundy, France, and I was blown away with these vineyards and small towns and, and small roads. And like, you know, I used to ride in Colorado up at Red Rocks or in the, in the, in the foothills. And, but when I hit France and in the vineyards with the chateaus and the wine, I was like, this is to me, this was like a play set. It wasn't even real. And I'm like, if I build it and bring people to come, this will be amazing. So, but let me tell you though, at DU, I put on a lot of events. I put on some mountain bike races, some film festivals. I did a lot of things, which no one ever came and I lost money. And, but at least I tried. I knew I always wanted to do things because um, I needed to keep myself busy. So you out there, you're taking an entrepreneur class, but you know, you're born an entrepreneur. Like you got to feel it. You better feel it in your bones right now. Okay. So you were over there. 
you were you loved it you loved the writing you loved the wine you loved the travel how did you get started with this business well i mean listen i i didn't write a business plan i didn't do anything thank god the internet <laughs> you lucky you kids in school like i didn't even we didn't have cell phones back then and like we we were just getting the internet um i so i put up a website and i i said this could be cool and i invited some friends of mine and they uh they stupidly paid me and I just like my cost, I probably lost money. And I, I took them around through the vineyards and I got them lost. I like got yelled at by French people and it was a total disaster. But like I tried it and I loved it. And actually I was stuck doing it. And I was like, this is something that I can do because um, travel and tourism to me is entertainment. You have an opportunity to take people on wonderful trips and things you love. Like you're out there in Colorado, you know what it's like to walk through the mountains or go skiing and biking. And when you're with friends, it's awesome. So like, if I could do that for a living, I didn't run the numbers. I just knew that if I put something out there, they would come. And I, and again, I think an important part of being an entrepreneur is actually, you need to have low expectations. Like I wasn't thinking we'd be the greatest company, you know, divine, and we'd win all these awards and we'd be big across the world. I just knew that I, I wanted to do this one thing and do it as best as I could and work really hard. I worked really hard. So travel and tourism, incredibly competitive business. Yeah. How were you able to differentiate from the competitors? How were you able um, to show? Go ahead. Yeah, well, listen, I, I also believe as a great artist or a business person, like you can look around and, and, and you need to survey your competition or whatnot, but you also have to be true to yourself and who you are and not try to be anyone else. I wanted to be divine from day one. And I, I wanted our quirky lifestyle and, and the things that I thought were special. I obviously, you know, you want to always study the masters and the greats and be aware of, of, of everything in your life. But like, you have to find out what you're good at and what you like. And what I liked back then you know, and I still do today was what we still are divine bike, eat, drink, sleep. I wanted to combine like the greatest wines in the world and the greatest, you know, the greatest food in the world with, with the wonderful hotels and small roads and like, and, and, and not just a bike experience. I, cause I thought just the cyclist is like, just going to look at their heart rate and probably not spend any money. But if I could get the, the, I wanted luxury. I wanted upscale and the wealthy clientele who wanted to live the good life. Cause I wanted to live the good life. And I lived the divine lifestyle. So, I mean, back then, you know, I was living in a one-star hotel and, and not doing so well, but I, I liked it anyway. Um, but so you have to, you have to, I definitely think you need to, you need to learn and read up, but also be confident on uh, what you do and how you do it. So you talked a little bit about uh, your target market. How did you identify that target market? And then that, you know, that target customer. And the second part to this, did it change over time? Did it, was it required to evolve? Well, I, I think the market came to us. I mean, I had a certain price. I mean, back then my trip was our trips. Well, it was mine because it was just me guiding with another person. It was 1995. So that price back then was like gonna, gonna sort of be who could afford that. And, and so per person that was around, you know, $4,000 and then you had to get your airfare. So, but today the divine client, again, now we're $5,000 per person on average per week. So that's $10,000 per couple. And then your airfare, if you're paying for airfare, you know, that's another 5,000. Basically it's about $20,000 to do a divine trip. And it's always been upscale. Um, and, but I don't believe that luxury needs to be expensive. I think to me, luxury is all about timing. It's just the things we do that are really clean and great and right, like cost money. Um, and, um, you know, travel, it doesn't matter, even, even low end, it, it's just expensive for what we do. We have a lot of logistics and, and we have currencies and we have bicycles and, and we have, a, you know, a, meeting a lot of people and guides and whatnot. And we, so, but um, I always wanted somewhat of the higher end market because I wanted the, the ability to really give a lot to the customer. I didn't want to be, I don't ever like nickel and diming. I never really like shopping at the low shop stores for food or whatnot. I always like the higher end stuff that is, uh, that is sort of um, harder to get. And that's what a divine trip is. It's not, not everyone does it. It's not for everyone and not everyone could go, but um, we are for everyone, but it's, um, it's, uh, it's just a, it's a it's a very specific trip that you have to love to just see the world and and and, and basically 
you know, actually the greatest things that we do really cost sort of no money, like meeting a countess or going in to some certain wine tastings or, or these beautiful views. All, and some of these great picnics we do are, 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 are the lowest cost and the highest bang for the customer. But when we're staying at some fancy hotels and it's like overpriced and there's not good service, it, I don't like that. But anyway. Uh, Andy sent me uh, one of their uh, books. And it's not even a brochure. It's a book about a lot of their experiences. And it, it's beautiful. It's well, so well put together. And so as I look at that, I did feel, you know, it was accessible to a lot of people, but really focus on that person that wanted a really kind of curated experience. Well, that was another thing. Like, I hate brochures, um, like travel brochures. I think they're all the same. And, and they, and, and you could, I just wanted our brochure to be beautiful and look like you're going to buy like um, a wonderful car or something different. So we try to market and be ourselves, not because all travel companies want to be the same. And I always wanted Divine to be a little bit different, but you know, our trips are amazing. They're in 24 different countries now. Um, and uh, they're really cool. Um, but, uh, and we're doing a lot of tours these days right now all over the world. And we got a lot going on right now in America too. So Right now, I just I just actually got text today. We have um, we have a we have a trip going on in Morocco that people sent me. Our 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 t our people are up high in the Atlas Mountains, and we have a tour going on in Tuscany, Shenandoah, Hudson Valley, um, and uh, and uh, Provence. I just I like to I, on my phone here WhatsApp. I connect with our guides, and I love to find out what's going on. And I post it on Instagram if you all want to check that out. That is awesome. Um, we'll drop all that in the chat. And as a, as we keep rolling through this, if you have questions, throw them in the chat and we'll get to them in about 15 or so minutes. So talking about those experiences, walk me through or when you first started curating and creating these experiences, how did you design them and how do you do it now? What, what's changed? Actually, nothing's really changed. You got to like go and live the place like I always say divine, we don't build our trips in a boardroom. We build them on the road. Like there are a lot of travel companies and you entrepreneurs out there, if you want to get into travel, you can like go to a travel show and you can buy a trip and you could resell it. That's not what we do. Like myself and our product people back then, I guess, so how it changed. I mean, I went all over the world with my bike. I rode the route. I went to the restaurants. I met the hotel people. I drank the coffee. I drank the wine. I said, you know, putting our trip together by bicycle is like a puzzle and everything needs to connect. The dots need to connect. The hotel needs to be near the restaurant and the restaurant needs to be near the winery and the roads need to be good. You need the small roads, da, 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 again and again. So we just, and we don't go everywhere. So that all needs to work. What's changed, I guess, today is I, like I said, we have product people on our team that, that I trust that actually understand divine lifestyle and what the clients want. And, you know, like I said, I, we have managers in all these countries that sort of go out and help design trips. We just, um, you know, put, put a new trip in the Azores and, and uh, we'll put a new trip in Sardinia and I have in the Cotswolds and actually I didn't go. So, but I do need to go, uh, but I trust these people to put together stuff and I will go, but I guess that's how it changed. I mean, to grow a business, to be an entrepreneur, you, you guys, you have to trust your team. You have to hire an awesome team. Listen, Divine has three things that I focus on every day, and that's the customer. You go above and beyond every day for that customer. Don't, don't complain. Don't complain. Love your customer. Why? Because they're paying you and they're keeping you in business. Number two, love your team and love your staff. Without my our guides out there and the people working in Boston and working in California, Italy, if they're not doing it, if I'm not loving our team, then they're not going to produce for the client. So you got to love your team and create an awesome culture. Culture in a business is super important. That's important to me. And love and respect your vendors. You're paying, you, we're relying on these chefs and these uh, winemakers and hotels. Like we have to be nice to them and respect them. I see a lot of people not respecting vendors and just demanding, give me, give me, give me. And that doesn't work. So you really need to focus to me on those three things, which are all, all match. And, um, and, and I, I, you know, I think being positive and, and giving, having a generous spirit, because if you're cheap, when I first started, I remember I'd be negotiating and trying to be cheap with some chateaus or, or not willing to pay the price. And it just didn't work to save $10. It doesn't do you anything. Be willing to pay to play. And especially when you start, don't ever be cheap to people. I'm telling you, it doesn't work. You want, if you pay the price, they're going to want you to be there. I think your parents might've joined us by the way. 
Hugh and Larry are there, my father and mother, great entrepreneurs. And uh, he had the great line that I always say that people do business with people, meaning I don't, who knows what the heck that means, but you just have to like connect a huge part about, you know, I learned at the University of Denver and whatnot is building relationships with friends, all you out there, like, you, you know, you never know who you're going to meet. You're going to do business with someone maybe in the future. People do business with people, create a good friend group. It's super important. That's great advice. Uh, the, Tony Shea, the late Tony Shea, that who was the CEO of Zappos, said that about partner uh, vendors. Make them your partners. You know, create, you collaborate, go into it together, and that type of relationship can be so much more successful. I see out there, Marshall Whalen. He's a great ninety-two D year. What an awesome entrepreneur he is too. So and his and his lovely wife. But you know, being that's why D U is so great. Like being in Colorado on the mountains. You, you get so inspired to be crazy and you got, you got nothing to lose. All you guys out there right now, you should be starting a business yesterday, whether it's doing a charity ride for something or, or just like just trying to sell something that at one of those uh, fraternities or whatever it is, just try it. Cause you bet you got to lose. Now I just say, you got a time until you're 30 years old and, and that's uh, you better not be living with your parents and you better not be having a bad job. So you guys got all the way to your 30 years old to try it. You can fail well, until you're 30. Well said. And we have, we provide all the tools here and the Do resources it. if you need it. Um, so why I, I, did, I read Danny Meyer's book. I just finished it about a month or two ago, setting the table and his whole book is on hospitality and, you know, for everything I've read and talked to you about, it's important to you as well. Why is that? Why is hospitality important? Oh man, I love hospitality. We have a saying here at Divine, it's called BTA, which means blow them away. You know, when you have an opportunity in this business, it's to me, it's like show business. When you come to the Divine, the curtain rises and it's our opportunity. And what we have is we can make the magic. So hospitality, you have the opportunity a lot of things are good, but you can make it great. And making things great is not easy. And when you have the opportunity to make someone happy, make them smile, make them remember stuff forever. I mean, when I visit our, when I see my, our clients, our guests around the world, they always like, oh my God, you guys made the sickest picnic. It was five years ago in Burgundy. It was unbelievable. And it was on a Tuesday. And I'm like, how do you remember that? And then I'm like, so what did you have for dinner last night? They're like, I don't know. So like, if you understand that in hospitality, you can give these moments that they'll remember forever. To me, that's a good life. I like that. That's what I prefer to do. Like, you know, I guess if I just wanted to make money, maybe I'd go and event, you know, a hedge fund or something like that, but that doesn't do it for me. You know, um, when you're an entrepreneur, you can be in charge of, of, of your, of, you know, your day and, and of people's minds and, and their love. And so, so hospitality is awesome. I love it. Um, and you, you have to love it. And you have to be willing to shovel you know what, because not everyone's happy all the time. Today, actually, I had to call someone. They did a trip with us in Vermont a few weeks ago, and it rained. Um, and they got lost. And they wanted to talk to someone. And I had no problem calling them. They said, you know what, it's so nice that you, the owner of the company, reached out and called me. And people just want to be heard. You know, um, I think there may be some manners were lost during COVID. A lot of people sat home a lot and sat with themselves and went crazy and people a little bit nutty right now. But um, I think just people want to be listened to. And, and, and as an entrepreneur and in hospitality, you have to listen and it's and just talk to people. You know, people, uh, people are pretty easy. Most of them understand. There are a few crazy people out there. And then sometimes you got to pay and have them go away. I, I, great advice. I, I've always believed that the customer knows that there will be issues at some point in time. It's how you it's how you solve the problem, how you handle the problem is, right. is where, where you make the change. I mean, you have to be confident. I'm confident in what we do. We have a 25 years experience and we're actually very good at what we do. And I know and our team knows everything about the trip. We have report, reports of every trip. We know what's going on every day. So when and if a customer calls, which mostly they call to say how great it was. But, you know, there are being also in this business, there are a lot of things that can go wrong that aren't your fault, i.e. weather or a restaurant that has some problems. Right now, there are a lot of problems, sadly, in, in, in you know, with the supply chain issue, um, with uh, lo low staff in, uh, in restaurants and hotels. So, but I think people are just happy to be outside and happy to be on a divine trip. And, and, we're, and all you can do is, and I tell my people this every day, 
And I say, just do your best. That's all I care. Just try your hardest. And that's all that matters. And we're not perfect. All of us are not perfect. And as long as you try your hardest and willing to like accept if you be happy that you do things great, but also if you don't do them well, it's just stand up and be like, you know what? I made a mistake. Well said. So you mentioned this a little earlier, starting your business before there was the, really kind of the internet was this viable thing. So 94 was kind of the start of the commercial internet. When I was thinking about this conversation and tourism, how the internet and technology is that really affected tourism, how has it helped your business and also hurt your business over, over the year, over the last 25 years? I don't think it hurt us at all. I mean, listen, it was I, the first thing I did, everyone out there, is I, I wasted $500 on a print ad in the Wall Street Journal and I sat by the phone. And the phone rang three times and they all asked for a brochure, which I didn't have. So I was like, that was a waste. I was so cocky. All you people out there right now, you should be cocky as hell. I was like 23 years old. And I thought that I put this ad in the Wall Street Journal and I'd sell a hundred tours. I actually got three phone calls for $500 or whatever it was. And they all wanted the brochure. So I said, I got to go to the internet. It's cheaper. Back then it was cheaper. Um, and you know, I placed a $450 ad on a website and that was for a year. And we did like $30,000 worth of business. So, you know, the internet has grown, I guess, I was a little bit, we were the first ones on Yahoo. Like I started this business, everyone. There wasn't Yahoo. There wasn't Google. I was on AOL, you know, it, it was so lame. And so, but it was great because <laughs> we were first ones like bike tours um, on Yahoo and on Google. And so we were really up there and we did well. And then like life, sorry, there's competition. People figured it out. And, you know, now I guess you'd say, I mean, I used to spend like, you know, 10, $5,000 for a year on Google. And now we're talking, you can spend up to $500,000. So, and they don't even send you a thank you note. That's what I hate about Google. We spend more on Google and I don't get a thank you note. I spend like $10 down the street here at some printing thing. And they send me like a cup and a thank you note, even though I don't like the cup or whatever, but they care. I just don't, why doesn't Google send me a thank you note? I spend a lot of money with them. There's probably some artificial intelligence listening right now and you'll get one in the mail tomorrow. Well, you know what? They do send out this, like they did send out this like electronic thank you thing. It's stupid, but whatever it is, Google and Facebook, sadly, we all have to spend a lot of money there. Um, and, and, but you know, whatever business you do and you know, the, 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 the landscape will change. And if you stick to what you're doing, you're going to get crushed. You need to think ahead, be ahead of the game and sort of try new things and can't be afraid to try it. So, but thank God, you know, um, you know, we, uh, word of mouth is a huge part of this industry and that's a lot of free business. This business is all about client acquisition. How do you get that client and how much does it cost? So, so we prefer to actually run really good trips and have people come home and tell their friends. And, and that's why I'm telling all of you out there, even though you're young and well, maybe some of you can afford it, like come on a divine trip, let's go sign up right now you gotta always be selling abc always be selling and always be closing if you're not you're lame you should like because like you can be on a train you can be on a plane you can be on a bus you can be on a bike ride you never know who you're going to meet so be ready to sell your business and talk about it and if you love what you do you can you can connect and you could uh, sell a tour well well said in one time real quick my man josh it's a good thing for the entrepreneurs i was once reading uh, on a plane like a um, I read about this this entrepreneur I won't say his name is a very famous guy and he I, it said that he did bike trips I was like oh my god cool and so I read this in an article I found his address I sent him a divine jersey um, and he got it he called me up thanked me and signed up for 10 friends on a trip he's been going with me for seven years so because I saw that and sent him stuff we've probably done about a couple hundred grand on that you put yourself out there. That's what we tell our students all the time. Put yourself out there, get yourself a little uncomfortable. You never know what will happen. That's great. Well, it never hurts to like say hello to someone. No. So no. what? I would have wasted $30 on the jersey. Doesn't matter. Didn't care. And I also want to point out, this is going to date me a little bit, but the fact that you were a visionary going with AOL instead of CompuServe or Prodigy. Well, well done. That's, that's duly noted. Right. Oh man. And we had dial up kids. We had dial up. I had it when I was living in France, I used to sneak into the front desk and pull out their fax machine and plug my computer in to download the emails. 
it was a total nightmare. But listen, I made it. We made it. Without your TikTok or whatever it is, Snapchat and cell phones, we made it. So I don't want to hear any complaining. The <laughs> stuff that you guys have to do things right now, you all should be like billionaires starting businesses. No excuse. I'm waiting for the question in the chat to be, what's a fax machine? But, um, oh, my God. So talk me through. This is when you and I met the first time. And how did how did you manage through the pandemic? I mean, obviously, everything shuts down and your whole business is in terms of people to people interaction. Yeah. Well, um, you, they don't teach you this one in entrepreneur school or anywhere. You build a business, right? Where you, you learn how to sell and create. This was, um, they don't teach you this in school either, how to take down your business and, and um, it's going to get ruined and you need to uh, deconstruct it. We had a return sales. We had to cancel all of our registrations. We just went backwards. I always say, because I'll never forget what it felt like. It's like climbing, say it's climbing Mount Evans there in Colorado on a bike. And we're almost near the top. And then all of a sudden, one of those crazy storms come. It's snowing and it's hailing. And someone says, turn around, go down backwards, blindfolded, and everyone's going to throw shit at you. That's what it felt like. So, and it felt like that for about um, nine months. So, um, you, you, you know, you just have to actually, we actually pivoted. Um, we always, we stood there. We took care of our clients. We took care of our staff. Um, we talked to people and then we had to like, you know, it actually taught us a lesson. We weren't big enough in the U S we had, we were doing a little, you know, a million dollars or so in the America. And now we turn that into several, like over five in sales in America of like a real business where I needed a kick in the, you know, what to really grow out our business in the States. So, you know, when you're going to get hurt somewhere else, it's going to expose you to like, what actually you're not good at. No one was built for COVID. Um, some people did well in it, we all know, but, um, but we, it hurt and thank, you know, actually I got to say most of the government is, is lame, but the government helped and the PPP helped. Um, and, uh, we just had us, we had to figure out how to do with deal with less. Um, but right now I think, I think the getting out of COVID as an entrepreneur is actually almost harder than COVID because, um, there's real supply chain issues. We can't buy bikes, right? Or we can, but it's very difficult to buy bikes for 2022 in the, in the forward. There are like no bicycles. I don't know. I mean, maybe you can go to your bike shop, Denver spoke if it's still there or wherever. And, and there's very limited bike supply. There's limited hotel space. Everyone is like going away now. And we had all these reservations, but hotels have gone up. It's just complicated. And listen, if you think business is going to be easy, like then go work at your, you know, go, I don't know. It's not easy. If you want to run your own business, you better be ready. And, and most people don't want that. I realize, like, out of my, I know people that start business, they just, they just don't have the stomach for it. Um, we were on our knees. I was on my knees. It was very difficult. But thank God for people, um, our staff, um, and people who um, all work together. And, and you know that if you have a great brand, you're going to live and you'll be fine. And so um, COVID was just a bump in the road and it sucked. And, but we're actually a lot better from it. So I also point out one other thing that you didn't say, but I think you probably did a great job. You weren't over leveraged either. You didn't have a lot of exposure. <laughs> well, um, you know, <laughs> a little bit. I mean, you always have to like watch your, I was never one to like be borrowing a ton of money. We grew divine organically. Um, I never had to borrow money. Um, I, yes, but I did have some bills for some, a couple hundred thousand on some bikes. And I, ha I had, we had, we had some exposure, but not crazy. So you have to always keep that in check. And also we actually have a lot of money in the bank. Usually in the hospitality business, mostly restaurants, sadly, you know, at, after Friday, they pay everyone, there's no more money. So like when COVID hit and it shuts your door, there's no cash in the travel business too. Um, usually in, in March and February there, you just have deposits. You don't have a lot of money, at least in what we do, which is uh, mostly like a April to November. So, but we had a lot of cash for that year because we had a wonderful 19 and all that money that we had that were going to be distributed as bonuses and was going to build on our company. We actually just had to use to, to survive. So it sort of was really a bummer, but what are you going to do? I mean, it really was a bummer because we had a ton of plans of buying a new building, investing in a lot of technology, and we just had to use that money. It was like a just buy, gone. Mm -hmm. 
So I have a couple more questions. Throw some questions in the chat. Paul will get to yours in a, in a couple minutes, but I would like to see some other questions. All right, so in, in March 2021, you sold a major stake in your company. Yeah. Uh, walk, walk us through uh, your thought process and why you did it, um, how you did it. Yeah. You can well, share with us. So, I mean, as an entrepreneur, you got to always sort of think of that. I, you know, I didn't create Divine to sell it. Uh, always throughout the days, if you have a great company, there are going to be people who, who are interested in you. It's sort of like dating. If you're cool at DU and like you're single, maybe someone's going to want to date you. Like you're going to go to the stadium or whatever that, those places and you're going to meet someone. Like people want to do business with you. So I always luckily had phone calls of actually most people I didn't want to date. There was one company that called me, Lindblad Expedition, who was very sexy. Uh, had a lot of brains. They're, Lindblad is like the pioneer of exploration. I've always known them. They were the first ones to go, go to Antarctica uh, on a ship. And this guy, Sven Lindblad, is, I've always looked up to him as a great explorer. And I love explorers. And there was a, another business out of Nat Hab that they have. It's out of Boulder. And they do polar. They do the same thing. Just really cool trips. And they wanted the bike. And we had the bike. And we had the brand. And they said, we are interested in you. We like what you do. Would you like to... This is what we want to do for you, Andy. You don't have to change Divine. You can run Divine. You, we're not going to tell you how to do tours. We want you to be a part of our family, and I can offer you 250,000 clients for free, the client acquisition piece, so I don't have to spend a ton on marketing. And we can help you grow and help your staff. And so it was a lot of back and forth and talking, and uh, they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. Forget about it. And, um, and I just thought that they could help Divine grow. Um, you can also take some money off the table and you can have some good upside. So um, it really just made sense. Like I could have said, OK, like 25 years here at Divine, I could still, you know, think um, that I can or my team, we could do it alone. But we discussed it and said with a with more smarter brains, like anyone there at school, like either you do things alone or you gather a group of people and you can be bigger, be better and be smarter and actually be more capitalized and, and all this fun stuff. So that's what I did. And they took 70%. Um, and we're going to work that out over years. And, and I still don't, I still feel like, like, you know, it's, it's still mine. And, and, and we, and I still am divine. And, but we just, it's, it was the right thing to do. It was the right thing to do for growth. And because my goal, and I said from day one is that I want the whole world to travel by bike. And the only way to do that is to really have the exposure to a lot of clients and have some, some cash to be able to, um, to expand. So that's what I want to do. Cause I think traveling by bike is the greatest way to see the world period. Awesome. I love it. I completely agree. Um, okay. I have a few more questions, but I'm going to open it up uh, to the people that are putting stuff in the chat. So I'll, Paul, I'm going to call on you and please unmute your mic and go ahead and ask Andy your question, please. Thank you, Josh. Hey, Andy. Um, I actually worked in the travel business for 10 years and recently left. I was a director of marketing and left to start my own marketing company. Um, have you done any major shifts in the last 20 months or do you see anything major coming marketing wise uh, for your business? Yeah, I mean, you always got to be you always got to be marketing. You always got to be selling. I mean, um, you know, you got to I don't know. I mean, we're just, we're doing, we, we have a little more cash to be spending. What I wanted to do was, you know, put the gas on the pedal when I knew that other operators uh, were sort of struggling. So, but we've, you know, we're always doing the same. I mean, we might be doing a little more mailing because um, um, we might do stuff like that, but we really haven't changed much. I mean, we had to definitely scale back um, our marketing, but we got the same stuff. We want to do videos, more videos. We want to really expose um you know, our, I think our guides tell a great story and, 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 and that's the marketing we like to do is storytelling and connecting and just stupid banners is not what I'm about, but um, marketing to me needs to be real and with some heart. So, um, but send us information on your company. We'll check you out. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Pierce, go ahead and uh, unmute your mic and uh, ask your question, please. Uh, hi, Andy. I'm um, Pierce. I'm a freshman at DU right now. And I was wondering, you said that you didn't borrow a lot of money. You didn't take out a lot of loans when you were starting your business. How did you um, get to starting your business without this and without some capital? Well, um, it was pretty cheap um, because 
well, I just needed to stay in a flea bag hotel, which is a one star. I negotiate a rate of $20 a day, which included breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So I was savvy there. Um, I had a little bit of money, a couple thousand dollars. I rented everything. I rented bicycles. So when I got the money for people to go on the tour, like I paid for the hotels and I paid for the bikes. I didn't need anything. And like I made all those reservations there. So I didn't need to lay out a lot of cash. It's something that I just wasn't comfortable with. And actually, we just started getting comfortable with that. I still don't like to put down a ton of deposits down on hotels. That's why I build relationships. I mean, we would have been crushed in COVID if we had a lot of cash out there. So you build relationships and, and, and you, you got to create good terms. And back then, um, Pierce, I just, I just, I didn't think I rented everything and I actually only had to pay when I got the money in. So that's a good business to start. Like, meaning when you get paid, you can pay for your services. If you're not getting paid, you don't have nothing to pay for. So that's how I rolled. Great. Thank you so much. You know, but it's real quick. A lot of people probably way more successful that, you know, they raise money. I don't know. Like right now, today, it's a different world and there's a ton of cash out there. And if you have a good idea, you can raise money. That wasn't me. And, um, but if it was, maybe I would have grown divide faster, but I grew it exactly how I wanted to grow it and, and not too big and not too much cash out there. Cause actually I'm not good at math. All right, next. <laughs> uh, so I have a question for you. Um, so what do you see the future of opportunity with travel and tourism? What do you future? Think gonna, yeah. Where do you think it's going? Is it going to stay the same or is it, is it going to oh, man, I think it's going to be the roaring twenties. I mean, I always believe it. Listen, people work to go travel. Like you, you guys are at school to either make money and then so you can go see the world unless I'm crazy. I mean, I think everyone wants to see the world. And to me, the world has grown, meaning, you know, I used to do just wine in Burgundy. I thought that Pinot Noir was great, but the wine world has grown. You know, you know, look at all these places where there are new great hotels and just um, there's always a new country, like where people, meaning not a new country, but a new destination where people want to go. So I'm pretty bull on it. I mean, I know that for me personally, I want to travel the world. So, um, you know, definitely COVID now, you know, that people got closed down for 18, 19 months. I think everyone wants to go. And I tell you, if you want to go, you better book now because I'm telling you, ho flights are going to go up. Hotel prices are going to go up. It's going to get tough. Actually, we've been pretty nice with our prices um, just because we just, that's the way we roll. Uh, but things are expensive and tight. So if you want to travel, uh, plan soon because like everything, it's going to go off the shelf. Do you think the type of travel will change more looking at instead of a cruise, looking at adventure tourism, those types of things? Or I've always believed in adventure tourism. It's always been a booming market. To me, I'm into health and wellness. I've never been one to sit on a cruise ship like those celebrity or whatever. Nothing wrong against them. They have really amazing businesses and whatnot, but I'm not into the buffet and all the people and that. No, no, no. I want small batch like local connect with the people health and wellness like that's what we're into uh, um you know i see it going because i just know how people want to live their lives they want to live longer they want to be healthy they want to ride a bike so so that's so that's where i see um yeah. You know, I look at, well, look at my parents were messing it all up, but um, you know, that's what I see health and wellness that I think is the future. I, we can see it, what's happening, you know, in hotels and wherever you are in restaurants. So I'm bull, I've been like bull on that for 20 years. So. Paul, you had another question. Go ahead, please. I know you just talked about um, cruising. Have you ever been on a river cruise, Andy? Um, I have on the floor. I, think, uh, I, I only asked that because the only one I've ever, uh, only place I've ever rode a bike on was on Alma Waterways River Cruises. They have bikes on board. That yeah, you take well, out. no, they all those river companies called us and to ask to partner, but it didn't work for Divine. Um, wow. Listen, I love being on boats. Our some of our and we have a trip right now. I've got to tell you, it's going on in Turkey. It's sailing in the Aegean. We have it, it, all of you should go on this trip. It is so amazing. Um, we have about, it, you know, six cabins, it's 12 people and we have our bikes on board and we just sail along the Aegean and ride on Turkey. Normally we go over to Greece, but Greece closed its border to Turkey's. It's a long story, but, um, you know, river cruises are awesome. I like, we work with Belmont resorts. They have these small, uh, barges and, and listen, any way to travel is cool. However, it works to you. We, me, divine, like small group stuff where you can, you don't feel like a, tourist you feel like a traveler because you're connecting with the local people 
That's what I like. It's not for a thousand people a week, you know, meaning our max on our group tours are 14 people. We have a van and two guides and that's how we do it. And we do try to do maybe, you know, anywhere from seven to 20 during every week. So seven to 20 every week. We can, yeah, it can get that busy. Wow. And it's, it used to be crazy. It used to drive. That's why I got gray hair kids. Um, like, cause you got a lot of things on the road. I mean, this year, I mean, we have vans that crash. Sadly, we just had someone in Provence while I was at a, a birthday party that someone got hit by a car in the South of France while riding their bike, people fall off their bikes. What we do is very dangerous. Um, you know, we have bikes stolen. We have, you know, things happen, um, but that's life and you got to deal with it. So it is what it is. And you can't worry about it because you just know that you're, you're actually, you guys are, or, you know, we're organized and we're prepared. So. Okay. Jasmine, go ahead and uh, ask Jasmine. your question. This is, a, this is a great question. Yeah. So my name is Jasmine. I'm a freshman at DU. And uh, my question is, so a big downfall that I see in entrepreneurship is having a vision that's too fast. Um, so essentially, how do you, especially with someone with a uh, a business with a strong passion how do you limit yourself and or go at a good pace in order to expand your business well i mean you just have to be real to yourself i mean you have to have like you have to have big big ideas and you have to want to make a dent on this planet else just go home but you have to be realistic and you can't be too like crazy so um again and that's mostly money but you need big ideas um, and, but you just have to be realistic with yourself because, and you have to be okay with getting punched in the face because it's going to happen and everyone's going to tell you you're lame and they're going to tell you a loser and they're going to tell you, you suck and they're not going to hang out with you because you're not that, you're, you're not going to be popular and you'd have no track record. So have the big plan and be okay to hear people say you stink, but just, you know, don't like, I see people who spend months on trying to make a business card. I want to make the business card and the logo, like. Dude, that's not the point. Like the logo and the business card come later, build your product and be willing to sell it. And you have to sell it. And once you get one person to bite, then you like, then you, it just takes one person. You need, I had two people that signed up. I was living at home with my parents and my mother said, Andy, the phone rang. And it was two people. They're a honeymoon clients from Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. I'll never forget. And I said, you really want to go on this trip? Send the check. They sent the check. I went to, I went to France. I paid for everything and they had a wonderful honeymoon and I lost money. But, you know, that's it. So just go for it, Jasmine. And, and like, you'll find your cadence. You know, it's like riding a bike. Are you going to go out and like slam it at first? You'll probably get ahead of everyone, but you're going to get tired. So just like understand cadence. That's a huge part. You're a freshman. You got time. Start a business tomorrow. You'll be great by your senior year. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> that's a great, great question. Um, so you must have a story or two that um, you could share with the audience. On customer, customer story, uh, experience story. I mean, I don't know why it's just popped up, but I remember when I first started and like we were at some chateau and like everyone drank a lot and had fun and sort of took off their clothes and jumped into the pool. And then the chateau didn't want me back. Um, <laughs> but, but like you have to create, you know, there's a ton of moments and, and basically like great moments where I've just met a lot of friends and, and met a lot of people. And I know, I definitely know, like I can remember the times when I was cycling in Corsica, like in looking down at the Mediterranean or like in Tuscany and I'm saying, oh my God, I'm holding on a bike. I say, oh my God, I'm getting paid to do this. Like, this is my job. And, and people, and I was riding through the vineyards of Burgundy, same thing. And I was just like, people back home have no idea what the heck I do for a living. And most people would always say, what's your real job? But like, um, you know, there's a ton of stories of meeting people. I mean, there are many times, you know, where the French would yell at me. I mean, I'd, I'd arrive at a chateau and and they'd be like, we don't have your rooms. I'd be like, you're kidding me. Or we go to a, you know, we go to a restaurant and they'd be like, always everything in France was no, no, c'est pas possible, no, no. And finally, I turned them over to the we, c'est pas possible. You just got to work at it. And especially when you start, there's a lot of no. And But you got to turn the no into we. I mean, that's all this. <laughs> no to me. I like that. It was funny. Your uh, parents have a, a crew of people over and it was unmuted when you were talking about everybody getting taken off their clothes and jumping in the water. And they were all, yeah. they all I learned that from my parents. But... <laughs> your mom just put up her hands. I guess. see it. All right. A lot so, of good things happen. So but. this is a question for me. You have one area to cycle, one place to climb 
one area to eat and one area to drink wine. Where are those places? So the cycling and the, and the climbing is different? Yeah, one area, yeah, very different. I guess like it always takes me back. I guess I say, you know, the road through the vineyards, the Grand Cru vineyards of Burgundy, you know, especially right now with the foliage, you're going from Chevre Chambertin to Chambeau Musigny to Nuit Saint-Georges to Bone. Like it's like a river of vineyards. And these are very, you know, these are, you know, 14th century old vines and 15th century. So that's like beautiful. The climb, you know, I love um, the Mont Ventoux in the south of France, which is um, 21 kilometers at 9%. And you're through the woods and then you get up top and it's like a moon shape and it's like massive wind and it's wild. And you can see all over the south of France, you know, or Stelvio in Italy, which is unbelievable. It's got like all these switchbacks to Stelvio. The favorite drink, what? Is that what? Yeah, one area to eat and one area to drink wine. Um, well, I, I, you know, uh, God, it's, it's so much France, Italy, but like, you can't do it. Like when you're eating in like a little village in Pienza or Moltocino or like high on the Val d'Orcia of Tuscany and you're like this person sitting over you and there's just doing some white truffles on, on your plate with pisci con fungi. It's a type of pasta with the local mushroom, the Puccini mushroom. And, and it's like, and the, and the, and the old, the, they're sitting there, the whole family. And they're like, mamma mia, marona, mangiare, mangiare. And like, that's a beautiful, beautiful moment. Um, and, and, you know, wine, I, you know, I, even in, I mean, there's all the, I love all wines, even from California, Sonoma, um, but I guess I'd say like a nice Barolo up there in Piedmont in like the town of like La Mora or, I mean, it's just unbelievable. I, a really nice Barolo or even Bordeaux. Um, there's the, the two parts, the left bank and the right bank are unbelievable. There's nothing like Saint Emilion. There's nothing like Margot and like, and just the, the difference all in the terroir. There's so much, there's so much great stuff, but like, I'm thinking about also, you know, I love Turkey and I love Greece. You know, and I love, I, you know, I, I love America. I love the Hudson Valley in New York, man. You can like, there's distilleries, there are farms, there are really good restaurants, you know. So in your backyard, we do Shenandoah Valley down there in Virginia. We, we do a lot, of, we did some stuff and I love Aspen, Colorado. We, and, and like, and, and there's a lot of great stuff, obviously in California. I love California, but California is so expensive that it's hard to operate. And there are a lot of fires that we have that have like sort of, you know, it's really sad what it's doing out there to the vineyards and, and all the hotel people. But, you know, Santa Barbara, San Inez, Sonoma, Napa is all awesome. So wherever we go is like fully tested and we don't go everywhere. I mean, we're to you all, you might think that we're big, but we're a boutique travel company and uh, where we go is like tested and awesome. So. Wow, that, that was wonderful. And all the students listening, because, you know, DU is a very big on study abroad. Take some of those bits and pieces go. in terms of the, yeah, that's what I always say. Just go, right? Just go. I, uh, Listen, I, I love you don't do it. If you guys don't do it, the person next to you is going to start it, you know, and so fail. Who cares? You got time. I told you, if you're living at home when you're 30 with your parents, you're in trouble, but you got all this time. You got 10 years to mess up. More than 10. Probably a lot of you aren't even 20. I was talking to my two older kids yesterday. They're 20 and 18, and they have a month that just kind of lined up this summer. I said, go to Asia. They're like, really? I'm like, yeah, go to Asia. Go. Tickets to Hong Kong are $650 right now. I mean, go. just go. Experience. And another thing to do, I think, is always to get internships. Go knock on doors. Go try. Go work at a company. Learn things. I always did that. I did. I worked at, like, Velo News up there in Boulder. I did a few things. I you know, I always tried to, no one, it was hard to get a job, but try to always intern. Really just bang on doors because people want your help. Actually, businesses want your help and you're pretty cheap and you're hopefully pretty smart. So, and you also need to build your resume too. So it's a good thing to do. And look up on LinkedIn for DUers. You know, you can call Marshall Whalen out there and like in Albany or wherever he is and like help him with his fantastic, huge real estate conglomerate. So hit up Marshall Whalen. And his lovely wife. I think Marshall's going to put his information in the chat, hopefully. But you know what? Andy's spot on for all, all you students. Great things about internships are not only what you figure out you like, but what you don't like in terms of large organizations, small organizations, flat organizations. Do you want to wear a coat and tie? What types of things do you want? And the, build your resume and build your, your tool, build your tool belt of experience.
And and you're not going to like it. Like, you know, kids these days, you guys like want everything like real instantaneous and to love things. Like you got to learn that like people aren't going to be that nice to you. Maybe not or whatever. But now today it's like, you have to be nice to people. But like I used to get hit and beat on like, and that was okay. But anyway, what I'm saying is that at an internship or wherever you go, when you start your business, um, it's going to be tough. So just deal with it and, and, and understand that um, it's not going to be easy. And, but it's a learning experience and, and you can't quit. You cannot quit. Like it, again, pretend you're climbing a mountain or skiing somewhere or riding your bike. If you turn around, you ain't getting to the top, period. And if we gave up in COVID, we weren't, you know, that's it. Understand you cannot quit. You can't, unless it really sucks. It's not what you want to do, quit, but start something else. Great advice. All right, so along those lines, what do you tell your 22-year-old self today? 22-year-old self. Um, wow. Um, I actually was probably a lot smarter then. 22-year-old um, self. Um, stay in touch more with my DU friends. Um, but, um, you know, I was probably, like, I, like cause I mentioned this, cheap. I was really afraid to spend any money. <laughs> And, and, and now, you know, you do have to spend some money and like, and I know that, like I said before, I was negotiating and I learned, I learned in France, like, especially, you know, they were like, we need to have a, we need to create the relationship. And back then I just was sort of looking at, I wanted to get the good deal on the rooming and stuff like that, which was if I built the relationship first and built the friendship, then you're going to get a better deal. And so I think first off, you don't come in all hot and fiery, like, you know, it all um, listen, like, um, cause uh, you know, if you're working with other people, you got to listen to them and you're, you're not always right. Uh, most of the time you're wrong. So my, my final question is when you're building your company and it, as an entrepreneur, it's, it's lonely, right? It's lonely in what you're doing, yeah. but who, who did you go to for advice when you, who were the people that you saw, you sought out their counsel when you're making decisions? Well, just that was a huge, huge part. And, and, and the reason I moved back from France was to be near smarter people in my home. Of course, like my, my father and my mother, my brother, my sister. Um, I had a you know, friends in accounting. I had, I had a lot of smart friends, my, you know, Marshall Whalen and certain people that I could just call. I was never afraid to call anyone. Actually, I probably called people way too much. You can't be afraid to ask questions. I call my uncle Paul or my aunt Rochelle. You gotta, I would call people and be like, cause I was actually a little bit insecure. I didn't know if these were the right things to do. And you just have to, I like to like, and that's a big thing. You need to feed off people. You need to you need to see what their reactions would be to something. You can't do everything alone. Also, when I worked alone, and back then I was working at home before the work at home thing, I'd go out during the day and I'd go meet the people at the post office and meet the guy at the local store. Like I needed people to talk to. So I, I got to know everyone in the neighborhood. You need to have a good support group and friend group. And if you don't have that in the parents or the friend or whatever, go make it. Go join some sort of like, entrepreneur club or whatever it is like go join you need you need the group and i've been fortunate enough because i i do like people and i like friends to have a huge awesome support group and and friends who are are smart and you and you get to know who has good advice and who doesn't and then you just got to trust your own but you got you can't be afraid you just gotta you know whatever you find someone on linkedin you call them up you know now these days it's a lot easier for you guys to connect with people Back then we had to like call people and they wouldn't pick up the phone. Okay. Like, and then they had caller ID. It was, it was impossible to date back then. There wasn't Tinder. I had to call people. Hello, it's Andy. You want to go to the stadium? And they click. <laughs> Technology has definitely changed since you started. Uh, you people have it easy, but you do have it harder because it's very competitive these days. Well, we, we need to get you back to uh, campus. Uh, Marshall, you need okay. to come back and check it out. We have a brand new community commons. We actually have a student union now, which is crazy. Uh, we have a new dorms, we have a new career building. It's, uh, it's a little bit different than the last time you were probably on campus. Well, I, I've been there, but I know how fortunate the kids are and like um, there now, the students. It's, I mean, when I went there, we loved it. We didn't care, but I know there's so much better stuff and. And, uh, you know, you guys are lucky to go in there and it's got a great reputation. So um, be proud of that and, and, uh, and go get it. 
and use use the stuff that's there. You need to take advantage of stuff and, and talk to people and use the university as your friend and, and get ahead. Yeah, that's great advice. Well, will everybody unmute their mics for a second and just give Andy a big round of applause. Andy, we really appreciate everything. So uh, thank you. 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 Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Andy. 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 Thank you, Andy. Sign up for your trips, everyone. Always be selling. Tell your parents that um, to, to call Divine and to go on a trip. Andy was going to put in the 30% off code in the chat. I haven't seen it yet. 30% off is good. How about I give anyone who will give you a commission? You can make some money, sell some trips. There you go. Sell your parents. I'll give you a couple, you know, a little commission. Connect with Andy on LinkedIn. All right, Andy, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And Andy's parents and relatives for joining. Thank you as well. It was nice to see all of you. Take They've care. They've always been great supporters. We love you. Without them, it wouldn't have been anything. Aunt Rochelle, I'm glad you woke up. Bye, guys. <laughs>